Thank you again, everyone, for joining our Could Pink Defund the Pentagon Demilitarize the Economy webinar, a uh, conversation with Miriam Pemberton. It's a couple minutes past the hour, so I think it's about time that we get started. I see people are still streaming in, and we're also live streaming on Facebook. So if you're joining us there, welcome. We're excited to have you here today. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen, and we can go ahead and get started with our webinar. Um, so again, thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, and welcome to the Code Pink Defund the Pentagon, Demilitarize the Economy webinar with Miriam Pemberton. My name is Carly Town. Um, I'm co-director of Code Pink and I run our Defund the Pentagon campaign here. Code Pink is an anti-war uh, women-led organization. And as you might've heard last week, President Biden recently released the budget, what he's calling blueprint, um, for fiscal year 2022, which included a proposal for the Pentagon budget, which would increase the Pentagon budget by about $13 billion from last year, um, which is really a disturbing continuation of the trend that we've seen um, under the Trump administration to increase the Pentagon budget year after year. Um, but we know at Code Pink that the real threats to our national security pandemics, the climate crisis, mass inequality, white nationalism will not be solved by continuing to increase the Pentagon budget, padding defense contractors' bottom lines, or building more nuclear weapons, uh, which is why I'm really honored to have the opportunity to speak with our guest tonight, uh, Miriam Pemberton. So Miriam Pemberton has been thinking about how to demilitarize the economy for decades. She was an editor and then director of the National Commission for Economic Conversion and Disarmament, and for 20 years, a research fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies, where she directed its Peace Economy Transitions Project. Between 2006 and 2012, she headed up the coalition that produced the annual Unified Security Budget for the United States, and through 2015, led the Budget Priorities Working Group. With William Hartung, she edited Lessons from Iraq, Avoiding the Next War, and is at work on six stops on the national security tour, Warfare Economies and Other Ambitions. Uh, she holds a PhD from the University of Michigan. So welcome, Miriam, to the webinar. I'm very excited to have you here. So much. And um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. And in, in just a minute, we're going to get started and, and start discussing with Miriam uh, a whole range of topics. Um, and I'm really excited about this really excellent conversation. Um, but just before we get into that, I just have a few reminders for everyone on the call. So first, if you're just joining us, make sure you introduce yourself in the chat box. Tell us your name, where you're coming from, and if you're affiliated with an organization. Um, and while Miriam and I are in conversation, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and type them in the chat box or you can use the Zoom Q&A feature uh, right at the bottom of your own Zoom box. And at the end of our conversation, we'll have about 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, and just for everyone here, the webinar is being recorded. And as a participant, you will be sent uh, the recording after we're done tonight. So without further ado, I wanna welcome Miriam. And again, thank you for joining us tonight, Miriam. Thanks so much for having me. So we're just, we're just gonna get started with this conversation. I think everyone here is really excited um, to have you. Um, so you're an expert on, on military spending and demilitarizing the economy, like I just talked about. Um, so let's sort of start off by, by setting the stage a little bit because there are a lot of numbers floating around about how much we spend on the military, on the Pentagon every year. Um, so first, can you sort of take us through how much do we actually spend on the military every year? Well, the answer is um, about three quarters of a trillion dollars every year. I always liked uh, uh, the, the quote from Robert Gates, who was George W. Bush's defense secretary, and then he was a holdover in the Obama years for a, a little while. And uh, he said, if the Department of Defense can't figure out how to defend the United States on half a trillion dollars a year, 
um, then its problems are much bigger than anything that can be cured by buying a few more ships or planes. All right, so he said half a trillion. Now we're up to three quarters of a trillion. Right, and I think that's really important context. That's always an excellent quote. Um, and, you know, I think something also that I wanted to ask about is um, we hear like the Pentagon budget, but then sometimes people talk about something called a quote unquote militarized budget. So how are those different and what would a militarized budget encompass? Yeah, so um, the Pentagon, so this 700 plus uh, billion dollars that, that this militarized budget is gonna get this year, certainly the Pentagon gets the lion's share. Um, <clears throat> in the Biden budget, it's about 715 billion, um, but that does not include uh, the, the budget to cover the nuclear weapons arsenal. That is in the Department of Energy budget, actually about two thirds of the energy uh, budget goes to our nuclear weapons arsenal. And it's again, not included in the Pentagon budget. Um, and then there are some other features like um, our militarized uh, foreign aid in the State Department that goes to um, uh, give money to other countries to buy US weapons. Um, and when you put all of that together, then you get the so-called top line for uh, the, the national defense budget, um, which this year is being proposed at $753 billion. Right, exactly. And then that, yeah. nor does that include actually <laughs> uh, the militarized uh, border, which is in the Homeland Security Department, which is another $52 billion. Right, exactly. I was going to ask about that, right? So we have that $753 billion number that you mentioned, but then that doesn't include, right, what you said, which is even more money to militarize our border. Um, so that's that's really helpful context. And I like to start with that because I think a lot, as I said, a lot of numbers are always floating around. Um, so, so we just ended, you just talked about the $753 billion Pentagon budget that was proposed by Biden. Um, and he, he just um, released that proposal last week. And I, I said, it's, you know, it's a budget blueprint for 2022. So, you know, this kind of caused quite a bit of controversy. So can you take us through what was included in President Biden's uh, blueprint for the Pentagon budget that he released last week, and also maybe what wasn't included, like what did he leave out from that blueprint? Uh, the blueprint is just what they call the top lines. And so, <clears throat> so it's um, uh, every department's overall budget without going into the details of, you know, what we're gonna spend it on. Um, and I would say that there is cause for celebration in, in that budget. Um, I think many of your uh, listeners will have um, seen this budget pie that the National Priorities Project does. Uh, so it's a pie including a slice for every part of the federal budget. And for about 80 years, uh, one, uh, the, the budget for the military um, has taken up more than half of the pie. Um, and this year, however, that is gonna change um, because uh, the Biden administration has proposed um, <clears throat> uh, about a 16% increase in the non-defense portion of the budget. That is everything um, that Congress votes on every year that is not military spending. Um, and uh, so, you know, that slice, it'll be nice to see that slice um, getting a little bigger and the military slice getting smaller. That does not mean, however, as you mentioned, um, that they have cut the military budget. They've just expanded that pie. Um, and so uh, the military budget has gotten um, a, you know, they, they basically are right that, that, that it is a flat budget. It is what we spent last year um, with, uh, as you said, $13 billion, um, which is, you know, the inflation effect. And so, um, so while I think we should celebrate uh, that we're spending more money on non-defense uh, expenditures, 
uh, this in the coming year than, than on uh, defense. However, we haven't managed to cut the defense budget. So we have work to do. Right, I, I definitely agree. And I think that's also another important piece of sort of context around military spending that you know you mentioned, right? Um, it is, it certainly is, you know, still an increase in actual numbers from last year, right? Um, but as I mentioned, right, this is a trend that we saw in uh, during the Trump administration as well, and the increases then were much, much higher, right? Over the course of the four years in the Trump administration, um, we increased the uh, Pentagon budget by 133 billion, um, if I remember correctly. And so also how does, you know, the current Biden uh, Pentagon budget proposal, how does that compare to, you know, Obama era Pentagon budgets and also military spending historically? Because I also like to sort of zoom out and think mm -hmm. that through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, the, the post-Cold War budget came down by about a third. A, a, um, and then, you know, eventually we get 9-11 and the budget soars. Um, and then we get to uh, the Obama uh, administration, which in its first two years actually um, uh, increased Pentagon spending to pay for the wars in Afghanistan and, and Iraq in the surge in those wars. Um, and so for the first couple of years, uh, we were spending more on the military um, than at any time since World War II. Uh, then the budget uh, came down, the military budget came down a little bit, uh, about 10% in uh, the, the following years. And then as you said, uh, the Trump administration, you know, uh, jacks it up again. And uh, that's where we are now. Uh, the Biden budget has, has, not, um, has not cut from the levels that the Trump administration um, had. So we are still <clears throat> spending nearly uh, more now on defense than we um, have spent since World War II, you know, you know, including the Reagan buildup, including, you know, all the war years. Uh, uh, now we're spending more. Right. I think, yeah, thank you for that. I think it's really important to, to put it into that historical context as well. Um, and, you know, when we talk about the fact that we want to cut the Pentagon budget, even by 10% would just bring us back to Obama era levels or not even close, right? Um, so I think that's really important. So yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, the other part of this, this webinar that I think we wanted to have a conversation about too is talking about demilitarizing the economy overall. Um, so first, you know, before we get into that, what does it mean to say we have a militarized economy? Um, well, uh, let's think about industrial policy. So that is the government um, organizing its industrial resources for a particular goal. Now, um, we haven't even been able to talk about industrial policy for years because it comes with, it's sort of a taboo topic. It comes with the idea of, you know, this is Soviet five-year plans, we can't do that, it's not the American way. Uh, we want free markets. Um, when, of course, we have an industrial policy and it is a militarized <laughs> uh, industrial policy. And the consequence is that we lead the world in making weapons um, and hundreds of communities across the country are dependent on Pentagon contracts. Um, and all of that spread is by design. We can talk about that a little if you want. Um, uh, we have hundreds, in addition to the, the private contractors, we have hundreds of military bases around the country and communities are uh, dependent on them and fight to, tooth and nail to keep their, their bases. Uh, meanwhile, the rest of the industrial base has been neglected. So. Um, we are way behind, for example, uh, the Chinese, you know, the Chinese are supposed to be our big military competitors when in fact they've been kind of eating our lunch at things like building solar panels and uh, electric vehicles. Um, so uh, President Biden talked about um, building a whole bunch of uh, offshore wind farms um, off the East Coast. 
um, which will be great. Um, and they'll create a lot of jobs, but they will not be jobs manufacturing uh, the wind turbines uh, and uh, the whole apparatus um, because we don't do that in this country because we've been you know, putting our eggs in that other military basket. And, um, and so you know, a Danish company is gonna be building the first wind farm off the coast of, of Rhode Island. Um, you know, then you think of uh, university research. Uh, most of the, the research money available um, is military money. And so you, you have academic researchers uh, kind of skewing their research to have some sort of military application so that they can get the money to do the research, you know, skewing our research priorities. Um, and then of course you have uh, trade, uh, the US seeding the world in weapons and um, subs with our tax dollars subsidizing countries to buy our weapons. So this is what I mean by a militarized economy. Yeah, I mean, that, that's very helpful, right? I mean, I think again, as I said, we talk about the, the Pentagon budget, but you know that puts into context like the ways in which our spending priorities at the federal level affect um, the way that our local communities are are organized, like you talked about. And you did mention briefly, um, sort of this is this is how it's done by design. It's spread out across our country. Could you could you speak a little bit more to that because I think that's important. Yeah, sure. Um, so this was a strategy that really took off after the Cold War, when the contractors were um, finding that they, you know, they didn't have a peer competitor country to uh, to justify, you know, increasing military spending. And so um, they came up with this deliberate deliberate strategy to um, spread contracts in as many congressional districts as they possibly could. This is clearly not um, you know, gonna increase uh, the efficiency of production. Um, it, it's, uh, uh, I call it a political protection racket. You know, it's, it's um, just making sure that uh, they can make the argument that you know, uh, jobs are dependent on keeping military spending high and growing. Right, exactly. And um, I think, you know, it's something we talk about all the time uh, at Code Pink as well, right? And I think it's an important part of the conversation if we're really going to be serious about reducing the Pentagon budget. Um, and so, you know, I, as I mentioned, I think one of the most common arguments, right, against cutting the Pentagon budget is that military spending generates jobs, like you talked about. Um, so what kind of jobs and, and how many jobs does Pentagon spending actually cre create across this country? You said it's, it's not necessarily the most efficient way to spend our money. Um, <clears throat> so I feel like, you know, maybe one of the best things I have done <laughs> in my career was uh, commission the original study that showed um, that a uh, billion dollars invested in um, uh, fields like education, healthcare, clean energy, um, you know, all of those sorts of investments are going to create more jobs than investing them in the military. And I actually found, and, and now that, that study has been replicated many times, um, it's now sort of taken over by the Costs of War project that I bet people know about at Brown and BU. Uh, and, um, you know, I was just talking to the author the other day and, and she said there's gonna be a new job study coming out. So um, that is, I think, an invaluable tool for making making our arguments. Um, but I also just came across uh, <clears throat> an interesting study actually from the US Commerce Department that I think dovetails nicely with um, this, this main job study, which was they were looking at exports and they said that a billion dollars for in um, arms exports creates about 3,900 jobs. But uh, if you look at a billion dollars invested in exports across the board, um, that generates uh, 5,200 jobs. So again, corroborating, uh, we are backing the wrong horse uh, for self-interested reasons as well as moral reasons. Right. I mean, that's definitely true, right? I mean, we, of course, have to make the moral argument, but there are really practical 
arguments to make as well, like you mentioned. Um, I think that's a really interesting uh, way to frame it. And of course, we cite um, your work and, and the work of Cost of War Project as well all the time to really reframe the conversation rather than does spending on the Pentagon budget create jobs to what could we have if we spent on other um, you know, elements of, of the federal government or other um, uh, sectors like, like education or that sort of thing. So I think that's really important. Um, Another, you know, kind of element to that that I wanted to also discuss is that I think some people would be surprised by how much of the Pentagon budget actually goes towards private defense contractors. Um, and why is our Pentagon budget so commercialized? And does that have a connection to um, the fact that spending on the Pentagon budget doesn't necessarily uh, generate as many jobs as, as we would like it to? I mean, uh... This has been true really since uh, uh, World War II and followed by the Cold War, um, you know, beginning what I think should be called a permanent war economy. Um, so for World War II, uh, you know, large swaths of the uh, of the American um, economy and industry were uh, redirected toward uh, producing for the war. So. You know, Ford Motor Company stopped, stopped making cars and started making tanks and, you know, on and on. And um, so um, many of those companies kind of started to, uh, you know, convert back to what they'd been doing. And, um, and then comes the Cold War and many of them are saying, uh, this is a good deal and uh, we're just going to keep, keep on doing this. And uh, <clears throat> the fact that um, so much of the private economy, uh, the, the private uh, uh, military economy is, um, you know, exists is uh, because, uh, you know, of this protection racket <laughs> that they've got going that, that um, you know, they're going to, uh, you know, make sure their campaign contributions go to the key committee chairs uh, of the committees that vote on military spending and and so on. And that, that you know, every member of Congress um, is told about uh, all the jobs that are uh, that are dependent on on military spending. Right. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, something that people are familiar with, um, even if they're not familiar with it in this context. Right. Congress people getting campaign contributions from corporate donors and then voting in their interest plays out all the time when we're talking about approving Pentagon spending as well. Um, someone in the chat said the only beneficiaries of war spending are Raytheon, General Dynamics, Boeing, and, and these companies, and all of the people who sit on their board of directors, which I think is a really accurate representation. Um, yeah, they talk about the, the revolving door <laughs> of, um, you know, people maybe starting out in, in the military, um, overseeing the contracts of private contractors, and then you know, going easy on them because it's, it's uh, you know, when they retire, it'll be nice to get hired by that same contractor. Um, and of course, you know, we've seen uh, problematic uh, appointments in the Biden cabinet that, that uh, you know, that have, uh, you know, strong ties to these big military contractors, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, I thought you were going to say something, but uh, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, that goes all the way to the top, right? Uh, the, the Secretary of Defense himself was on the on the board of uh, directors for Raytheon. Right. So absolutely. Um, well, now that we've talked about how much of a problem, obviously, <laughs> our Pentagon budget is, mm -hmm. you know, our militarized economy and how entrenched it is, it is um, within our society. I, I hate to ask this question, but how do you think we can demilitarize the economy? Like, what can we actually do to fix it? Um, I know it's a huge question, but it is also, right, like why we're here today. Um, so how can we start to demilitarize the economy? I mean, you know, it basically comes down to, you know, the, the key is moving the money, you know, uh, uh, from the Pentagon to the civilian side of uh, the economy to sort of create demand pull toward a civilian economy, um, to create new markets 
uh, and new opportunities um, for the economy as a whole, and in some cases for for defense contractors to um, move into um, civilian areas. Um, and so, you know, that's that seems to me to be the key. And uh, it seems like we do have some exciting possibilities here. I think um, this infrastructure bill really does open up. You know, we're going to want to expand it, but but it really does open up um, some possibilities for the kind of new in green industrial policy that we um, that we absolutely need. So. Um, you know, as we're making arguments uh, uh, to members of Congress, um, you know, even the Pentagon um, says that climate change is a security threat um, that, you know, a loud divester uh, is going to create uh, problems, security problems that no uh, military on the earth is going to be able to, um, to solve. Um, and, um, you know the kinds of investments that they're talking about in that jobs bill um, it are you know really some of the elements of uh, you know a new industrial policy that can uh, potentially um, you know shift the economy from a militarized to a civilian uh, oriented economy. But as we know, the inertia of an entrenched militarized economy um, is a powerful force. It will require, it's, it's not enough to just invest on the civilian side. It will require, you know, cutting the military budget and we haven't done that yet. Uh, I had a couple of other ideas or one, one idea, um, at least uh, we were talking about communities and how de dependent they are on Pentagon contracts uh, mm -hmm. and uh, as I was saying to you earlier, I, I spent too much of my time on Earth um, trying to um, create this vehicle for communities to um, kind of have, uh, you know, set up a planning process, uh, bringing together stakeholders, uh, the public officials, economic development folks, uh, you know, the nonprofit sector, all, all different stakeholders in a community that is defense dependent and saying, you know, what kind of economy do we have? What kind of economy do we want? How might we get there? Um, and as I say, um, there's a program in the Pentagon. Uh, it's an agency called the Office of Economic Adjustments. So uh, it's supposed to be, it gives planning grants to communities um, uh, to uh, fund and give them assistance in setting up one of these planning processes, bringing stakeholders together and planning a community transition. Um, however, <laughs> uh, last year they changed the name of this, uh, of this Pentagon uh, agency from the Office of Economic Adjustment to the Office of Local Defense Community Cooperation. And so, uh, you know, they wanna keep those communities where they are they don't want them to have any kind of transition. And so um, I was though talking to um, some folks who have um, been talking to folks in the Commerce Department, there's an Economic Development Administration, EDA, and um, it has been really anemic for many years, um, but the Biden administration would like to um, kind of beef up that, that agency and uh, transitions of all kinds, planning grants are, you know, part of what they do. And so it occurred to me that that Code Pink is um, very good at, uh, you know, creating community conversations. Um, and so, uh, you know, if we're going to um, relax the grip of Pentagon contracting on communities across the country, um, this might be a place where, you know, activists could be um, important. That's really excellent to hear. Yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're right. I mean, uh, only half of the puzzle is is sort of defunding or, or we talk about divesting from more. I mean, the other half is investing in a peace economy and sort of um, imagining new sort of political horizons around that. So I think that's 
that's really exciting. And, and I think we'd love to talk more about that. Um, and, you know, another question that I had too, you, you talked a little bit about um, stakeholders and you also talked about Joe Biden's infrastructure bill. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if um, you could tell us a little bit about what it would take to really institute sort of a just transition away from um, a militarized economy to one that's um, uh, you know, demilitarized and, and what role would we have to play um, in bringing in like labor unions and, and maybe the labor movement into that just transition? Mm -hmm. um, well, as you probably know, the, the term just transition um, is, is mainly uh, when they talk about it, it's mainly about um, tr just transition for fossil fuel workers into good paying green jobs. Um, and, uh, you know, so a just transition would include, you know, retraining funds and bridges to jobs that actually exist, you know, that you're being trained for and ideally um, some income support. Now, these are the things that they mainly talk about for uh, fossil fuel workers, um, but uh, you know we want to think about them uh, for for defense workers also. But I have been um, talking to a great guy who is um, a former head of the Machinist Union in the state of Connecticut, a uh, wonderful guy who's really very interested in in climate change and moving his union more to focus on climate change. And so I asked him about. Uh, a just transition, you know, for defense workers, because because his union has been mainly defense workers, um, and he said, well, he thought defense workers were kind of um, not first in line. So first in line, he says, for just transition funding would be fossil fuel workers. That's where you know most of the energy is. But he also said he's been in conferences where um, people of color are saying. Um, you know, okay, you want to give just transition to fossil fuel workers. Um, we never got the chance to be fossil fuel workers. We were excluded from those jobs. And so how about a little just transition uh, assistance for, for us? And so, um, you know, he was um, not, um, you know, too optimistic that, uh, the kind of just transition assistance that we'd love to see for defense workers moving into um, civilian manufacturing um, was going to be that popular with defense workers, because as we know, defense work is very highly paid or or more highly paid than most um, other manufacturing um, jobs. Um, but I'd say, you know. In, in thinking about how to bring the peace movement and the labor movements together, um, I, you know, I think this infrastructure bill is is an absolutely golden opportunity um, to uh, to make some of that happen and expand the job space. Um, but you know, the peace movement and the labor movement have worked together in the past. Uh, you know, the notable examples tend to come from situations where defense cuts have been made and defense workers are casting about for, for solutions um, to their jobs problem. And so um, they are, you know, likely to be, there have been some very interesting examples of, um, you know, of uh, coalitions between the peace movement and, and the labor movement, but we got to get those defense cuts because um, well, back to my uh, labor leader in in uh, with the machinist union in Connecticut. Um, he happened to represent uh, the workers at Pratt Whitney, which makes the engines for the F-35 fighter jet. Um, but uh, also in the state are you know it's a very defense dependent state, and um, there's also Electric Boat, which makes all the nuclear powered submarines or many of them. Um, and he said there was an interesting split. So the, the, the workers at Pratt Whitney would, um, would be fine if today we're making engines for the F-35 and tomorrow we're making wind turbines. You know, they'd be, they'd be okay with that. They're, you know, some of them would actually welcome that. 
Um, electric boat tends to hire people with security clearances because of this new because of all the nuclear uh, aspect of their work, and so um, uh, they tend to be more more resistant. Um, so that was an interesting divide. But uh, he also said that you know the real problem. He goes back to World War II that in World War II, we were not asking, you know, how are we gonna pay for this war? Um, we were asking, uh, you know, we need 50 ships. Uh, you know, where are we gonna get the materials? Who's gonna build them? And they just, you know, kind of organized around that goal. And he says, you know, now we have a climate crisis that is, uh, you know, in some ways as big as World War II, and that's the kind of mobilization uh, we need to have where we're not so worried about, you know, can we afford this? Um, because we absolutely can't afford not to, so. Right, exactly. I think that's that's a really important point. Um, and I think it's something that the climate movement has been really um, important in driving home is, is, you know, flipping the conversation to actually climate change is happening now. And um, it's something that, uh, we're going to have to, we, we need to deal with immediately. And I also think um, sa similar situation when talking about, um, you know, demilitarizing the economy, it's, it's going to be incumbent on us to explain to people how we can do that without, like you said, having people lose their jobs. And I think um, studies that you've done and the Cost of War Project have done showing that um, spending uh, in, in almost any other industry will create more jobs and, and good paying jobs as well is, is really important to information. Um, so that, that sort of wraps up um, some of the questions I wanted to ask you, but did you have any last thoughts you wanted to add before we move into, we have a couple of questions from the audience as well. Um, why don't we do that? Okay, sounds good, great. Um, so I have a couple of questions from the chat box and then I also have some from the Q&A. It looks like a couple of people had um, a few more questions about um, Pentagon spending and what that encompasses. So somebody was asking, what is the discretionary budget and how much goes to defense? Like what's discretionary versus non-discretionary? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so the discretionary budget is the budget that Congress votes on every year, doesn't include so-called mandatory spending on social security, uh, Medicare, Medicaid. Um, that's basically the, the distinction. Right. Great. Um, and um, I have a couple of other questions specifically about what the Pentagon budget encompasses as well. So there's two that I kind of want to fold together. So it's, is there a component of the military budget reflected in the CIA, DEA, and any other agents like covert operations? So is that, is their funding covered in the Pentagon budget? And then is the Veterans Administration budget included in the Pentagon budget? Um, so the intelligence budget is sort of a black budget. It's, it's they don't reveal what it is. Um, you know, people have gotten some inklings, but, um, but you know, basically we don't, we don't know about that one. It's certainly not included as a line item in the, in the, um, in the federal budget that that gets released. Um, so when I used to do this unified security budget, the idea was um, security is not just military. We need to look at uh, diplomacy and uh, foreign aid and non-proliferation spending. And um, when we look at that, we say, hmm, we're spending a lot on what I called offense, which is to say military, and not very much on defense and not very much on prevention, meaning the State Department's uh, diplomacy budget and, and so on. And it was always a question of whether, when we were doing this analysis, um, whether we should include veterans affairs. Um, it is a separate budget um, and, uh, you know, we, we could have used that. I, I sort of focused on what are we spending now for you know, current conflicts? But Veterans Affairs is certainly uh, an expenditure um, from our, our war fighting. And so there's a, certainly an argument to be made um, for uh, including that in a consideration of what do we mean by, by security, national security spending, um, but it is not included in the 
in the um, uh, part of the budget, including the Pentagon, called national defense. Right. That, that's really helpful. Thank you. I think, um, as I said, a lot of numbers floating around and people, it it's, can be confusing. Um, I have another question um, from, from Nancy. It says, is there a map of where all of the manufacturers are in the United States that have weapons contracts from the government or something, a resource like that? Uh, no, <laughs> um, at least not that I've found. Um, there's, a, there's a useful website uh, called governmentcontracts1won.com. And it's a private site, um, but you can plug in uh, your state or your county um, and they will tell you all the, you know, all the contractors. Um, it's a little unclear to me, you know, what they're counting sometimes, but it certainly gives you a lot of information about um, uh, contractors in your area. Yeah, it's an interesting question. And also I think, you know, something we didn't touch on, but is very true is that the Pentagon is the only agency that has yet to, to pass an audit. Um, their budget is also <laughs> really difficult to actually understand what they're spending their money on. And I've um, been doing that for, for many years and I still have a hard time. <laughs> I don't okay, think well, they necessarily want it to be uh, transparent. <laughs> they want to absolutely. hide it. <laughs> absolutely, yeah, it's in their interest for sure. Um, and you know, every once in a while we get stories about how expensive things are and the money that they're actually spending this outrageous budget on. Um, I have some other questions as well. This is a little bit about strategy and maybe Congress as well. So <clears throat> somebody asked, is there much of a contingent in Congress who are for reducing the military budget and are willing to engage in efforts towards that end? Um, uh, well, um, just last year, uh, was created a new caucus in the Congress called the Defense Spending Reductions Caucus. And so um, if you're doing uh, legislative lobbying, I would say um, go and find out if your member of Congress is uh, a member of that Defense Spending Reductions Caucus. And if they're not, uh, talk them into it. So, um, you know, there it is. Uh, and the Progressive Caucus, um, has uh, been a leader to some extent in um, efforts to cut the Pentagon budget, and the and the um, the two co-chairs are, uh, you know, definitely uh, making that pitch uh, this year. So, um, so I would say the Defense Spending Reductions Caucus and the Progressive Caucus um, are definitely um, places to uh, to look, and you know. I'm sure there's quite a bit of overlap. <laughs> yeah, there, there definitely is. And I think that's a really good question. I mean, it's something that um, it is really exciting. I mean, to have a, a Congressional Defense Spending Reduction Caucus is, is historic. Um, and I, I put a link in the chat box for everyone here. You can go to codepink.org slash um, DSR caucus to see if your representative is in that caucus. And if they're not, to ask them to become part of that. Um, because it's an important way to build up support um, to reduce the Pentagon budget. Um, so we have just a couple more questions. Um, some of them have been similarly themed, so I've kind of grouped them together, but this one I think um, also speaks to a question about tactics and it's why not create a department of peace as proposed, I think by Marianne Williamson, they're saying to work on the transitions you're mentioning um, and maybe removing money from the Pentagon budget in, and into the department of peace. Yeah, um, that's an interesting idea that that has been floating around for <laughs> for a long time. Um, and uh, you know, I'd be fine with it. <laughs> um, I think uh, you know, mostly what I've done is look at the structure of the government as as it is, and um, think about you know what departments in the civilian part of the of the government, you know, such as the State Department, uh, you know, EPA, the Energy Department, uh, uh, you know, HHS, uh, education, you know, how those can be, um, you know, used for peaceful purposes. Um, but, and there is a, you know, an, a U.S. Institute 
of peace. Um, but in my view, you know, they do some nice uh, seminars and and um, some nice studies, uh, and they have a beautiful building that has, looks like a dove on top and everything. Um, but they're not really um, they're not really pushing any envelopes. I would say in in uh, the direction of a demilitarized economy. So another another department, um, you know would need to really be pushing and not just kind of uh, doing nice studies, I guess. Um, um, so, you know, um, I'm, uh, I'm certainly open to it. Right, and I think, um, you know, I, I, I couldn't agree more that, you know, having the idea around, you know, putting more of our energies and efforts into creating um, something akin to a peace department, department um, sounds like a great idea. And also I think, um, at this moment, particularly in history, it's interesting because um, Joe Biden announced his Pentagon budget proposal and then also very soon after announced troop withdrawal um, from Afghanistan. And so at Code Peak, we've been trying to talk about, you know, listen, if we're ending, if we're starting towards a trend of ending forever wars, that should be reflected in our Pentagon budget as well, right? Mm -hmm. Why have this enormous Pentagon budget um, if we're still if we're not no longer engaging in these forever wars. Um, so we have to be really vigilant about that. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Um, well, I think that's about all of our questions um, from the audience. And I, I you know, I want to thank you for, for being here with us today, Miriam. I think it was really educational. I think people learned quite a bit. I know I did myself. Um, and you know, I just wanted to say any any last things you wanted to touch on before we sort of wrap up here today. Uh, I guess um, you know, I would make a pitch for as you're doing your congressional work um, and your work in the community. Um, I'd make a plug for the National Priorities Project. Many of you have used their their resources before, but if anybody doesn't know. Um, you can go to nationalpriorities.org and you can um, plug in, you know, your community uh, and or your your congressional district, your your county, and um, generate a whole set of trade-offs of, you know, this is what we are spending it, on the military. This is what we could be spending, and and I've always found that those sorts of trade-offs are a really valuable tool, tool to um, uh, to use with individual members of Congress um, uh, in your own congressional districts. So I would I would just make a plug for that tool. And then finally to say that um, I have been working on this book uh, and I am really enjoying doing it and I'm getting to the end. Um, it's, it's about six communities around the country that are very defense dependent. And, you know, so I, I look at, you know, how they came to be that way and, you know, what part of the military industrial complex do they, uh, do they feed into? And each, in each case, I've um, uh, looked for communities that at some point in the past have done some kind of demilitarization effort. And so, um, I am looking forward to finishing up that work and getting it out to uh, folks like Code Pink. <clears throat> Hope it'll be useful. It will be so useful. I'm really looking forward to that book as well. And I would love to know when it comes out so we can let everyone you know, know um, at Code Pink because I'm sure everyone will want to read it. Um, so thank you so much for that, Miriam. And, mm -hmm. and thanks. thank you also everyone for joining us. Um, it's been a great conversation, some really great questions. Um, and chat generated um, together. And so I think that about wraps up everything for tonight. Um, again, thank you, Miriam, for an excellent conversation. It's been really helpful um, you know, for the movement to just have a better understanding of our militarized economy. Everyone here will receive um, a recording of the conversation and of the chat box. So don't worry about trying to um, copy that down. And that wraps us up for the night. So thank you so much, everyone, and have a good rest of your night wherever you are zooming in from. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.